Dear participants, welcome all of you. Today we will organize our third workshop in the scope of Bujems 2021. Dear Associate Professor, Ezi Karja is our keynote speaker with the topic of the tale of molecular machines. We would like to talk about her brief resume. Ezi Karja is a computational structuralist biologist with a specialization on integrative modeling and biochemical, uh, bio biomolecular dynamics. She completed her bachelor and master's degrees at the Chemical Engineering Department of Boazic University. For her PhD, she joined the group of Alexander Bonwin. Her thesis was dedicated to the incorporation of various types of experimental data into the modeling of biomolecular complexes. After her PhD, she moved to European Molecular Biology Laboratory Heidelberg for carrying out her postdoctoral studies in the labs of Teresa Carla Magno and Orsolia Barabas. There, she worked at the intersection of experimental and computational techniques, where she developed computational tools to translate experimental data into high resolution structures of protein nucleic and nucleic acid machineries. Since May 2017, she is the principal investi investigator of computational structural biology group at the Izmir Biomedicine and Genome Center. Dear guests, we would like to invite Associate Professor Ezgi Karja to the stage for her speech. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So there might be a lot of um, buzzwords or unfamiliar words or technical terms to you, but just in brief, um, I'm a theoretician, uh, like basically by training an engineer and a theoretician who is applying theoretical principles on understanding how uh, molecular machines work in the cell. And today I will, um, I prepared a presentation for you to just briefly illustrate what we do, like our main research topic, research team, in general in my field. Uh, so that will uh, make up the first part of my presentation. And then, then in the second part, um, I will briefly introduce you an application. And then finally, I will finish my presentation with a demonstration of this uh, application. And then afterwards, or in the meantime, uh, if you have any question or comments, um, we can work, we can, uh, I will try to address this. Uh, so as first, I'm sharing my screen to start my presentation. So as I said, uh, we work on understanding the biology of molecular machines. That's why I named my presentation as a tale of molecular machines, because basically this is what we try to understand um, by theoretical means. Um, so um, our research is actually concentrated at the uh, nanometer scale. Uh, so life at the nanometer is uh, what we're interested on. And this is what is basically the essential, uh, the essential units of life. So if we have a, a very strong uh, electron tomogram or like a tomography machine or a, microscopy, a microscope, and if we take an image of a, a cell, so here we have a image of a minimal uh, cell, uh, which is from a bacteria. We'll see that uh, there are a lot of units inside. And these units, as we see in this figure, they, they are like spherical images or like blobs. So our idea, our uh, aim is basically to fill in the details of these blobs. So all these blobs that you see over here, uh, they correspond to different machineries in the cell. So as you know, cell is acting like a factory basically. And like in any factory, we have units. And in these units, we have unit operations. And again, like in any factory, each unit is consisting of subunits, which are working in harmony to carry out, to carry out a specified task. And this is what we try to understand uh, in our discipline in computational uh, structural biology. So here I'm going to um, present you a video that I took from YouTube from Hyrodex. So in the cell, as you see with the standard microscope, what we see is an organelle and in this case it's a mitochondria. But if we try to zoom in more, what we are going to see is something beyond the limits of like classical microscopes. So basically this is an illustration and uh, it's a combination of lots of lots of work that go, that went on over the years. And here, what we see is the membrane of a mitochondria. And I'm sure that all of you know uh, uh, the mitochondria. And as you see in this case, uh, we have uh, the mitochondrial membra membrane. 
and we have a, a difference in concentration of protons in this case in between the inside membrane and outside membrane. So in one case, we have more protons, uh, which corresponds to intermembrane mitochondrial mem membrane, state, uh, membrane uh, space. And then outside the membrane, we have fewer pro uh, protons. So there is gonna be a, a exchange of protons uh, between the, um, uh, uh, through the membrane. And uh, this is um, uh, being aided uh, by another, by a machine. Uh, which is being called um, uh, ATP synthase. Um, so this is again an illustration, so it's not an actual observation or actual movie. Uh, but what we have here is that, is, is that um, the concentration difference between the uh, inside the membrane and outside the membrane is being used to move the propeller part of, the, of this machinery. And, the, and thanks to this uh, movements, as you see at the top of this machine, at the pink part, uh, there are uh, molecules, chemicals entering, uh, which are ADP. And thanks to this motion, these ADPs are becoming ATP. So as you know, ATP is the energy source of the cell, so adenosine triphosphate. And in this case, adenosine has two phosphates and an extra phosphate can be attached to this uh, molecule thanks to the... Um, uh, mechanical movement that is happening due to the concentration difference in the cell. So as you see um, in this specific case and in also other specific type of cases in the cell, uh, the functions of the cell, the uh, essential functions of the cells are being carried out by complex molecular machineries. And these machineries are being composed of different components which are coming together and they come together to uh, through following uh, uh, forces of the nature, which are physics, chemistry, etc. So this um, uh, understanding the machineries um, is uh, is a very complex. Uh, the, such machineries is a very complex procedure, because technically we are not able to, as I said, we are not not able to um, observe uh, the motion of this machinery. Uh, by uh, classical microscopes. So we have a technical limitations there. And because of this, uh, we are using different approaches just to get an insight of what's happening at the nanometer resolution in the cell by using different experimental and theoretical techniques. So uh, we are also specifically understand, uh, we are also specifically interested in understanding uh, what's happening at the uh, machinery level uh, because we know that um, form follows function. So in this, uh, in this particular case, for example, ATP synthase case, as you have seen, the bottom part is acting as a propeller and it's the molecular shape at the nanometer uh, uh, scale is, uh, is also shaped as a propeller, like the propeller of a turbine or, uh, or an engine, etc. cetera. Uh, so as we know, as we understand the shape of this, then we can also understand the function of this part of the machinery. So thus, uh, as we know that form follows function, that's why we are particularly in interested in understanding the form of the molecular complexes, molecular machineries. So to illustrate this point uh, more in detail or, uh, uh, or a bit further, um, I will introduce you um, a very recent case that we are all on, that we are all aware of and we know the biology uh, of it. Uh, I mean, a bit or more doesn't matter. I'm sure that are, you are all familiar with it. Um, here, um, what I would introduce you is uh, the, um, uh, the biology of coronavirus, but not at the infection level, but just before the infection level and the, and the step which is leading to the infection. Uh, so here we are particularly interested on the spike protein, which is attached on the surface of the uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, as you see on the um, uh, upper uh, left part, upper left corner of this slide. So all these red items or red cubes, shapes, whatever, or triangles, uh, there are the spike proteins. These are basically the receptors of the coronavirus. So these receptors are the ones which find their, um, uh, their host uh, region in the human cell. Uh, and then the recognition of the host 
on the human cell is being carried out by the receptor binding domain. Uh, and as you see, if we make a correspondence of this figure to this one, so this is the stem region, so this is basically the part that uh, keeps all the uh, spike entity together. And there's also another accessory part here, which is an extra domain. But, but uh, in principle, the receptor binding domain, the RBD domain of spike is, is re responsible uh, to recognize the um, uh, target site on the host, basically on the human cell. So let's see uh, what the spike protein is doing again through a movie. So this is a, basically, this is the outcome of a simulation and you will see uh, on the movie um, who performed the simulation, et cetera, so the citation. Um, but the simulations have been, these simulations have been shown to illustrate um, the reality as well. So this is how we contribute uh, to the um, to the experimental science, so we hypothesis we make simulations, we establish hypotheses, which are then being proven uh, uh, by the experimentalists. So as you see here in the simulation, uh, this uh, spherical object is the uh, the uh, container, basically the envelope of the virus, which encapsulates uh, the genetic material of the virus. And this is about it, basically. As you know, uh, viruses are uh, very viruses are very simple, but on the other hand, uh, they make your cells work for you. And in that in that sense, they are simple but uh, very smart. So all these spike proteins are uh, are are uh, placed on the uh, envelope of the SARS-CoV-2 on this case. So the spikes are being uh, represented uh, in this movie as gray. And we have also uh, blue dots here and there, as you see, these are sugar molecules covalently attached to the spike protein. Uh, so the sugar molecules are being used by the spike, spike protein as a shield. So these uh, uh, sugar molecules are shielding the actual sequence of the spike so that the body, like our bodies, cannot recognize the spike as an antigen. So the, uh, the body sees them as sugars and that's why the uh, immune system is not being um, uh, triggered. So this is what the virus uh, is, has been trying to do. And as you see, the sugar molecules are being attached over the spike protein all over. So with this work, uh, uh, which was published in this year, uh, the researchers tried to understand the contribution of these sugar molecules on the dynamics and recog recognition of spike by the immune cells. So let's uh, watch and uh, try to understand what happens here. So here, the receptor binding domain, as I introduced to you in my previous slide, is being presented as um, um, a light uh, blue. Uh, we will also see this. As you see, these glycans, so these are sugars, covalently attached. We see all the atom representation of uh, this, uh, of spike. And as you see in this case, uh, this was revealed by their simu uh, simulations. The receptor binding domain is an up position, and up means that it's basically out for an hunt to find its uh, host uh, receptor. So, which could, which are basically in our lungs, considering the initial entry stage of the virus, because we inhale the virus, and that's how it 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 reaches our lungs and finds the finds its host. So let's continue uh, uh, seeing the structure um, of, uh, of spike uh, in uh, the RBD open form and how the glycans are oriented. And as you see in this case, um, the RBDs are in the receptor binding domains, the recognition domains are closed. And in the closed state, uh, the essentially important amino acids of spike proteins are being shielded by the, uh, or being coated by these sugar molecules. So this is um, uh, this is how we understand and how we see that this um, uh, this virus is actually very smart. Um, so let's uh, continue um, seeing the movie till the end. Okay, so uh, these are the results of a simulation, uh, uh, as I said. So what we see over here in the end is that uh, there are closed, Confirmations of the receptor binding domain, which is a kind of resting state. And when the receptor binding domain opens itself up, basically uh, just uh, stands up and starts looking for its receptor, 
uh, then the recognition process starts. And I will, I will illustrate to you how the recognition process is being directed or is being established. So the receptor binding domain of spike, basically the whole coronavirus, lands on the angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, which is present in different tissues in our body. Uh, for example, we have it in our lungs or, uh, or on our uh, uh, bladder, etc. So all the uh, symptoms that you have, coughing or diarrhea, etc., they are all related to the entry points of, the, of this virus. So wherever this virus can find an angiotensin-converting enzyme, uh, which is an enzyme uh, regulating the blood pressure, uh, we start having symptoms. And here we have uh, the receptor binding domain landing on the angiotensin-converting enzyme, which is embedded our cellular wall. So this is our, uh, uh, our um, uh, cell membrane, basically. And where the RBD lands, basically the coronavirus lands on the surface of the ACE2. Uh, you can um, also illustrate it as a landing space for a shuttle, for example, is not being used by any, by any other molecule uh, in our body. So basically the virus doesn't have any competition inside the body. That's why as long as we inhale it, we have it. And then if, we, if our immune system is, we don't know how, uh, but not programmed to fight against this virus, it enters our immune system, it enters, um, it lands on ACE2, then with this, finds a stable position to land for landing, then it starts um, the mechanism for its entry into our cells to replicate itself. And as I said, if we are for some reason programmed to fight against this virus, we are able to fight it, but otherwise uh, we don't have a chance. We don't have much chance. And if we just zoom into this interaction, um, this is what we see. We clearly see this uh, landing space, as I just mentioned, which is not being used by another molecule um, in the cell. Uh, and this is the initial recognition mechanism of the virus uh, or entry mechanism of the virus inside our cells. So all these machineries are being understood only when we know uh, the structures of these machineries at the atomistic scale uh, through experiments, through computations. Um, and as you uh, and and if we understand um, how these interactions takes place, for example, uh, we will be able to understand, for example, how um, the variance of the on the receptor binding domain, basically the variance circulating across the world, will impact the RBD binding to its host. Or alternatively, we can working we can start working on these interactions so that we can uh, find an end we can find a protein which can bind to RBD more stronger than uh, ACE2 so that we can block the uh, recognition of ACE2 already inside the cell. And this is, a, this is gonna be a sort of ACE2-based drug. So this is uh, not something that uh, we invented. Uh, this is basically uh, out already in the literature since the um, appearance of the um, pandemic. And this is one of the ways that scientists are working on to, uh, to block coronavirus um, uh, invasion of our cells. Uh, so what could be done is that, as I said, like if we understand this interaction at the atomistic scale, meaning like how the atoms of these amino acids are arranged in the space in 3D dimensions at the nanometer scale, then we will be able to understand the mechanism at the ground level, like molecular working mechanism. And also based on this, uh, we can start um, um, uh, devising new therapeutics uh, acting uh, against diseases uh, like this one or like other diseases. So what we do is we try to do this process like understanding the machineries and then based on this developing uh, new molecules, we do this uh, in computer. Uh, but it's essentially we are just uh, a piece in the puzzle. So uh, there are different, uh, there, there are uh, molecular researches, molecular research um, um, programs um, um, established at different um, uh, systems, for example, in real cells, which is in actual cells, which is in situ research, or uh, we do molecular research in vivo, which is a, um, which is a type of research program carried out on, um, on model systems like mice or plant, et cetera. 
or we also can do it uh, at the lab scale where we only isolate the proteins that we are working on and initially uh, just try to understand how they work at the lab scale. And what we do in computer by um, performing simulations is actually uh, complementing all these three research platforms. Okay, so this is a sort of introduction to um, what we study in the lab uh, and our uh, research uh, topic. Basically, we are trying to understand what the molecular machines tells us, what their structure tells us uh, about their tail, about their life cycle, about their function, about why they are here on Earth, basically. This is what we try to understand. Um, and as I said, this was the first part of my presentation. And the second part, um, I will just demonstrate to you um, how you can toggle through the coordinates of the biomolecules, where you can find them, how you can download them, how you can visualize them, etc. Okay, so I will, in this part, I will briefly introduce to you uh, how these structures are determined and then where we can get these structures, then we will go over the coordinate file uh, format, and then finally we will visualize these three-dimensional coordinates in a particular molecular visualization program. Uh, so besides the um, simulation methods, um, so this is what I initially introduced because this is our initial, this is our primary research field. Uh, but this is, as I said, a complementary to to um, um, uh, to experimental research. And in the on the experimental side of the research uh, regarding uh, determining the structures of molecular machines, we have uh, three fundamental approaches. And all these approaches they get atomistic level information. So uh, it's like we don't have the microscope, but it's like as if we really zoom into a system at the nanometer scale to see what's happening. And these are just, you don't need to understand what these do, but just for you to have a, um, uh, for you to have heard of these names. Um, and these are uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, X-ray crystallography and cryo electron microscopy. So the experimental structures come from three different uh, techniques, which are very tedious and very, these are very sophisticated methods. And after uh, determining the coordinates of the proteins or complexes uh, of these like molecular machineries, all these uh, coordinates are being deposited into a universal data bank. So this is a very cool story because uh, wherever you are in the world, if you if you solve the structure of a complex or a protein, then you deposit it to this data bank, and then everybody in the world can access uh, this database. So I think this is pretty cool. Um, and uh, what happens is that the as, as you see on this um, image, uh, the source of these structures can come from different organisms, and then by using these organisms, different structures are being resolved then all these are being curated and being deposited in a database, which has an interface. It's all free, all open access, and you can all reach, and as you will see how you will be reaching it, and then you can all see, um, uh, see um, what's in there uh, by just surfing through a web server. So this is the um, screenshot of this um, site. If you, I will also uh, show it live on a, um, a web to, on the uh, uh, on the web browser. But if you want to note its site, uh, it's just rcsp.org. But if you Google it as Protein Data Bank, you will also dump into this. So it's it's very uh, very commonly uh, known in the field, um, and it's also uh, uh, very often used. So this is like your entry point to, to this uh, website. Um, as you see over here, you have some collections. Uh, and also on the side, you have a molecule of the month uh, where the biology of a, a, of a complex structure or a protein structure is being represented presented over here. Also, uh, we have under this learn tab, um, there are PDB 101 lectures uh, which you could use to educate yourself on this or if you're a teacher you can also use it um, to teach during your class 
And as I said, this is your entry point. And um, uh, we will uh, start uh, with an illustration of uh, these um, uh, coordinate, uh, the web page for the coordinate file uh, that I just represent that I just presented to you in the first part of my presentation, where the spike protein is bound to the ACE2 uh, receptor. So in the PDB, um, so the in protein data bank, all the coordinates have um, an ID which is composed of four characters. In this case, for example, it's six M. OJ, so it's unique. If you Google 6MOJ PDB, you will directly uh, reach this uh, website. And on this page, we have the demonstration of this structure, as well as the experimental details, how it was determined, etc. This could be a bit um, advanced for you. It doesn't matter. Um, so if you're interested, you can continue reading. But if you toggle down on the web page, if you scroll down, you will see that um, there are more details on the content of the structure. For example, we see that as, as the first component of the complex, we have angiotensin converting enzyme from Homo sapiens. And we can also see, the, we can also get the sequence of this. So we can get the amino acid sequence of this uh, building block. And the second building block is basically the S protein, spike protein, and this is coming from uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. So it's a hybrid complex. So one is uh, the host, uh, Homo sapiens, and the other one is pathogen, which is uh, the virus. Um, and, and, the, if, and the coordinate file that you would get, and I will show you how, how to get it in a while, the coordinate file you will get from this site is being formatted in two formats. Uh, and these are uh, basically a format which is being, these, these formats are being um, consensusly um, decided by a collection of scientists and, and they are being used uh, through all over the world. Um, and among these, PDB format is the oldest format and it's being used very often and it's more human readable. That's why I will continue describing the PDB format. So as I said, these molecular structures, these are basically coordinate files. So let's say if you have a coordinate file uh, of, a, um, of a satellite image, right? You will have um, X, Y, Z coordinates and some extra information. Uh, and in this case as well, we have X, Y, Z coordinate, informa coordinate information together with the localization of each atom in space with respect to each other. For example, here we have the first amino acid on the sequence, which is an uh, aspartic acid. And aspartic acid is an amino acid and it contains uh, several atoms and each atom has an X, Y, Z coordinates. Okay, so these are all relative coordinates. Basically, uh, they are just somewhere in space. And I will show you how they, how they um, are illustrated by using a, a molecular visualization program. So these coordinates are being visualized by multiple tools. Um, we often use uh, PyMol for visualization. Um, the educational version of PyMol is free and open to use. So if you're curious guys, you can just uh, download it. And my demonstration will be also on PyMol, uh, which has this sort of interface, which we will see in a while. And also uh, PyMol is a very widely used program. And because of this, uh, there, are big, there are tutorials, wiki pages on it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, with this, uh, I will stop uh, sharing my screen uh, to switch to the um, demonstration part. Mm. I will first start with the PDB site. Demonstration of the PV side. Okay, so let me make this full screen. Uh, please let me know if you don't see anything properly. So as you have realized, the screenshot that I presented to you was taken in March because we had the molecule uh, of the month from March. So the, um, uh, the um, uh, careful eyes would have already noticed it. Um, so as you see, we still have the coronavirus resources available here on the PDB site. And the PDB database 
a protein data bank is actually 50 years old. So it's a very old uh, archive. Um, and here you find a lot of content related to its celebration uh, for its 50th year anniversary. Um, as I said, under Learn, you have PDB 101. So this could be quite interested to you, interesting uh, for you. Uh, so you can browse, browse resources by category, for example, structures related to health and disease um, or related to cancer, biology, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and there are also learning materials, teaching materials, education corner. I think this is really um, interesting. I mean, it could be very useful for you. We have also a sci, there's also a sci arts, science arts section. Um, where a lot of nice artworks are uh, uh, deposited, uh, which correspond to um, these um, uh, molecular machinery images or uh, cellular images. As you see, for example, here we have the very nice illustration of uh, coronavirus. This is this is a very famous scientist as well as an artist, um, and uh, David Goodsell and in this case, in, and in the other cases as well, uh, he basically paints this on a canvas. So this is a classical paint, and that's why it's very cool. So you have other uh, illustrations as well. For example, you can see how Zika virus uh, looks like on a canvas. So this, this have a one-to-one -one correspondence to its biology. Uh, and, and, and basically because the, uh, uh, the artists, and, and also thanks to the fact that, uh, this is thanks to the fact that uh, uh, the artist is also a scientist. Um, anyway, uh, so let's go to the um, main page. And on the main page, if we um, look for 6M0J, Okay. Uh, we'll see the entry, which I present to you as a print screen. Here as well, there's an option to have a three-dimensional view without the use of any extra um, application. So here, with, by using our mouse, we can rotate it. Uh, the um, the boxes here, these are the sugar molecules attached on H2 as well as on the receptor binding domain over here. Um, so the, um, the representation here is different than the representation as you have seen in the movie or on the slides. Uh, these are always the same molecules, but we just represent them in different forms just for the sake of uh, visualization. Uh, for example, this format is uh, being described as the cartoon format, which I will uh, uh, now illustrate also uh, by using Pymo. Uh, so let's stop this share as well and go to Pymo. Okay. Okay, later on, if you um, download um, PIMO uh, through web, uh, you can do this also by yourself. You can go back to this recording on YouTube and try to follow what I will be doing. Um, so uh, through PIMO, if I'm connected to internet, I can directly download the coordinate file of the uh, PDB ID that I am uh, looking for. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, 6M0J. Okay. So here I have uh, two building blocks. One is ACE2 and the other one is uh, receptor binding domain of spike. So from this C tab, I can color these by different building blocks as we call them chain. Okay, now we have one in, uh, uh, cyan or blue and the other one 
uh, as green. So this is the cartoon representation. So if you want to represent this in the way as we see it in the movie, we can show them as spheres. Okay, so in this case, each um, uh, atom is being represented uh, with a different uh, color. So if we zoom in by using our mouse, as you see, these um, mm, reds are oxygens, blues are nitrogens, greens are carbon, for example. So it's amazing that by only using a couple of elements, uh, we, the, uh, the body or the, uh, the nature is building its uh, complex proteins, which are coming together to establish the machineries that I just presented to you. And we can also show them as cartoon. This is what we had in the beginning. Uh, we can also show them in six, where we will see all the side chains of the amino acids. Uh, for example, let's click on something and zoom on this uh, and label also all the atoms. Okay, so as you see, we have a carbon here, another carbon, another carbon, another carbon, and two oxygens. That's it. And the, com the covalent combinations of these basically makes up glutamic acid, which is an acidic amino acid. So it's one of the 20 amino acids, and it has an acidic characteristic, and its characteristic defines the local shape and the structure uh, of, this, uh, of this protein and how it's going to interact with other proteins. So all these little differences basically makes up the whole um, complexity of the nature and, and the whole complexity of the universe. So with this, let me zoom out, show as cartoon, because then it's uh, less crowded. Okay. Uh, and then just rotate this around. As you see here, this is the, here is the landing side of H2, as I just mentioned to you. So maybe I should also, um, I should also show them a surface. Okay, so um, as you see, so this is the ACE2, and then this is the landing site of ACE2, okay? So the functional side of ACE2 is actually here, the channel. So this channel is being used by, uh, by our um, own hemostasis, um, but uh, this part of ACE2 is not being used by any other molecule. That's why coronavirus, as I indicated, can land on this uh, host receptor without having any competition with any other molecule. Um, okay, so with this, um, I stop this and then finally, I will just briefly present to you uh, my research group and then uh, we can finish um, my part and then and have your questions for further discussion. Okay, so the this is here is my research group. So of course I didn't present to you any uh, research details in this presentation um, because it that might have sounded too complex to you. Um, but in the end, uh, it, this is what we are interested in as a team. Uh, we are based in Izmir, like the organizer of this uh, workshop. And uh, um, and and uh, we are all interested in understanding the uh, structure and function relationships of uh, molecular machineries. Um, if you want to follow uh, what we do in the lab, uh, you can also follow my uh, Twitter uh, Twitter account, um, where I uh, pre usually um, mm, present um, what um, uh, we do in the lab. Uh, and these are the supporters of our research. Uh, and, and that's it, I think. We would like to thank Associate Professor Ezi Karja for her speech. And we continue with questions and answers session now. If you have any questions to our speaker, you can write on the chat or you can ask directly. 
For asking directly, you can use the raise hand motion through Zoom as well as the chat part and YouTube comments. So I have a question for you. <laughs> it was a very interesting and enjoyable presentation. First of all, thank you very much for accepting for our invitation and uh, holding this wonderful workshop, I think. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, thank you so much again. Uh, what are your su suggestions for young scientists who want to work in, um, in the field of molecular machines or computational biology? Do you have any suggestion about it? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, um, so the, I actually the optimal way, of course, would be if you are really interested in the field. The optimal way would be um, to have an internship in a lab which carries out this type of research. Uh, but let's uh, leave that aside and uh, let's start with uh, what you could do on your own. Um, as I just presented, for example, you can start uh, going over um, the introduction, introductory lectures uh, on Protein Data Bank. Um, and then uh, following this, um, you can um, try to uh, find uh, related uh, lectures or courses online. Um, but this might, this might be, um, maybe th this might be of too much detailed content at the level. Uh, so the, maybe the, the best would be to start toggling through uh, PDB 101 and maybe communicating with your biology or uh, chemistry professor uh, to work together on uh, what's over there and how to get more insight on protein structures, etc. And so that could be one option. And the other option would be the optimal op option, of course, uh, wherever you are based, just with the keywords that you pick from this talk, uh, you can start Googling um, uh, uh, researchers which are in your city or which are uh, in, the in, your, uh, in your country. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, we can do many things online um, nowadays. So you even don't need, to base, don't need to be based on the same city. So it would be great to have uh, an opportunity to spend some time in a lab uh, where this type of research is being carried out. And this, uh, we actually exercised uh, with uh, Jansu uh, last semester. Uh, we had uh, together two, two high school, uh, very talented two high school students and Jansu, uh, we uh, uh, prepared, uh, worked on a project. They worked on a project and we supervised them um, on uh, predicting the impact of uh, spike mutations on the coronavirus infectivity, for example. Uh, so this was uh, like, this is the ultimate learning um, experience, I think, just to be in a lab, to be present. So if you can create that opportunity, that would be great. But if not, uh, going through online sources and if you are really, if you feel stuck and if this becomes heavy for you, just consulting your um, chemistry or biology professor uh, should be helpful. Great, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, great, thank you so much. We have uh, one comment in YouTube leave. Congratulations, they say. Um. <coughs> Is there any question from our participants? Yes, there is a question for, from our participants. Okay. Um, I'm reading it out loud. First of all, thank you for inter this interesting and useful presentation. Are these molecular machine designs exemplary in machine technologies or other technology fields? For example, is it used in nanorobots? Um, thank you for this question. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, so the molecular understanding, molecular interactions is basically the basis of um, 
being able to design anything, uh, and on a machinery which would work in a human cell or outside the human cell, or the same idea is being also applied in uh, material science uh, to design smart, um, uh, smart cotton, for example. They're all based on the same physics and um, uh, biology, basically. Uh, and theoretically, we, we usually use the same methodologies as well. In that sense, science, science is pretty unifying. Uh, uh, so definitely. We have another thank you from Sarat Kızlar and Ibrahim Aydın, who also who was also the person that asked the first question. Thank you. So, if there are no further uh, questions, if you want, um, uh, we can also finalize. Anyhow, the video will be online on uh, on YouTube, and uh, you will see um, that on my presentation on every slide, I included my email address. Uh, if you want to ask something later on, you can also uh, use my email address, send me an email to ask further questions. Um, then one more time, we're thanking Associate Professor Ezi Karaja for her speech and dear participants, our workshop is over. Thank you for your participation. You can always rewatch this video on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Good night or good morning in your time zone. Thank you. Thank you so much.